Thank you. I've just been examining the eggs of one of our strangest of desert animals. These are the eggs of the brine shrimp, a very small organism that lives in alkaline pools in the desert area. And of course, these eggs are vitally important to the brine shrimp because it enables the animal to survive during the dry periods when the pools, of course, disappear and then the adult brine shrimp die, but by means of this egg, the species is carried over to the next wet period. Now in the desert, we find a great many different types of both animals and plants. So to tell us of desert life, we have invited as our guest on Science in Action, Dr. Robert T. Orr, who is Associate Professor of Biology at the University of San Francisco, and is also curator of birds and mammals at our own California Academy of Sciences. He's an old friend of ours, and uh, we've had him here on Science in Action before, so I'd like to invite him in right at this point so that uh, we can have a chance to say hello to him. How are you, Dr. Orr? <coughs> How are you, Earl? What's the, uh, what's the can that you have there? Well, you've been demonstrating the eggs of these desert brine shrimp. Now, I'd like to show you what happens to those eggs during the rainy season. Oh, good. Suppose we go over to a desert pool here now. We'll assume that this pool dried up last summer. The adult shrimps that were in here laid lots of eggs, and these eggs get scattered over the desert. Some remain in the dried up lake bed here. And months later, the rains come. Now pretend it's raining here. The pool fills up, and in about two days, we find that these brine shrimps hatch out. In other words, Let's if see. we were to take a net at the end of two days, and provided good uh, temperature conditions were there, run the net through the pool, we'd find that we'd have some adult brine shrimp, the eggs having hatched at that time, and then we were to put those into water in an aquarium such as this, we'd see what interesting little fellows these brine shrimp are. Of course, they are very good fish food, and when our fish in the tank discover that they are there, they're going to be snapping them up quite eagerly. That, of you course, know, desert brine shrimp. <laughs> You know, the important thing about our brine shrimp is that it adequately satisfies the four factors that determine whether or not a particular plant or an animal can survive on the desert. Well, now, Let's these little uh, fish in here at this time, I see of uh, uh, their scolaires, and uh, they're starting to become interested in the brine shrimp that are in there, of course. And uh, these, uh, uh, this type of food, uh, brine shrimp, is used by a great many aquarists all over the world. That's right. Now, uh, what about these various factors, Bob? That's well, the thing I'm wondering the four about. factors are temperature, water, food, and alkalinity. Well, then, regardless where a desert might be located in the world uh, and what type of an animal or plant is involved, still, these four factors are going to be important in determining what kind of an animal or plant can live in that area. That's right. Supposing we look at a map now and see the deserts of the world. The most extensive desert extends practically unbroken from the west coast of North Africa across the dark continent to Asia and then many thousands of miles to the Gobi Desert of central China. There are other deserts in South Africa and in Western North America and parts of South America. Of course, in Australia, we find one of the largest deserts. Uh, that would probably be about the second largest desert. Well, now, Bob, before we look at some of the various uh, animals and plants that are found in desert areas, uh, how about a quick review of the way in which deserts are formed? Well, there are lots of different factors that go to form deserts, Earl. Some of them are geological and some of them are climatic. Let's uh, consider the Colorado Desert as an example. We have back here a chart showing a cross-section of Southern California. Over here, we have the Pacific Ocean. Here, the coastal mountains rising up fairly high to Mount San Jacinto. And over here, Palm Springs, and away over at that far end, the Colorado River. Now, the interesting thing in the formation of that desert is that uh, as far as all Western North America is concerned, our rain originates as a result of evaporation from the Pacific. The moisture-laden air rises, and then it travels east. Now it comes to these high coastal mountains. What's it do? It has to rise up in the air like this in order to get over them. And of course, it's quite cold up here, so as a result, the, uh, the rain is formed, and we have a considerable amount of precipitation here. That's right. We get precipitation coming down here, and over here, we have cold, dry air. Now this air flows down the east side, and as it comes down, it compresses and naturally warms up, which gives us a vast mass 
of hot, dry air over this desert area. Now, that is one way in which a desert may be formed. Well, of course, this section in here might well be said to be a rain shadow, and we do have deserts where a um, lot of uh, precipitation is present during certain times of the year. Quite often, it uh, isn't distributed so that you have conditions as you would in a temperate area. That's right. Actually, as far as that's concerned, Arctic regions and uh, the tops of mountains above timberline are essentially cold deserts. Water is present there, but it's frozen and therefore unavailable to life uh, during most of the months of the year. Consequently, we find that the plants are dwarfed and animal life is scarce. Well, salinity and alkalinity are, of course, things that do produce deserts in various parts uh, where uh, desert uh, conditions may be there, although uh, we may have a lot of water. Now, how about such things as a seashore? I think the seashore illustrates this very well. We find that we have lots of moisture in the form of uh, uh, humidity and uh, 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 water in the ocean, but the fact remains that uh, uh, behind there we have sand dunes, and uh, these sand dunes uh, uh, develop a, a desert environment. Uh, in other words, we have plants there that are more or less desert-like. Uh, I think you can think of that the next time you go to the beach, that it's actually somewhat of a desert. Yes, well, there's a general tendency to think of a desert as a barren expanse, but uh, that often is not the case. And I believe you, I remember that you told me in uh, 1952 when you were working in the Viscano area in Lower California that uh, it hadn't uh, rained there for something like uh, three years. Well, that's true. Uh, as you can see, however, there are quite a few plants growing here, and we actually found uh, animal life extremely abundant. Mm, well, now, just what is the mechanism, Bob, that allows these animals to live in these extremely dry places? Well, moisture is the first and the most important thing. We find that many plants, like uh, members of the cactus family, illustrated very well by our barrel cactus here, have either eliminated or uh, lost their leaf structure so as to cut down on evaporation. Uh, during the rainy season, these plants take up large quantities of water and they store it in their cells and it tides them over the dry period. Well, I have another type of cactus here I'd like to uh, examine at this point. Uh, this is the prickly pear cactus and the important thing about this is that this large fleshy place that you see here is not the, uh, is not the leaf, this is actually the stem. And the plant uses this to uh, store water, and of course you can see how the sap is running out at this point. On the, this point, we have something else that's very interesting. These are prickly pears, and they're very good to eat. They're used uh, uh, commercially. You chop them in two, and uh, inside you have something that's like a pomegranate. There are many other kinds of cactus that occur in the desert. I think the saguaro, or giant cactus, we see here is very uh, interesting. These plants actually, you know, sometimes store as much as 30 tons of water. Some of the largest uh, members of the lily family grow in the desert, like the uh, agaves and yuccas. The yucca has a very beautiful flower, as you can see here. Those blooms there, typical desert lily. Very interesting plant. Well, speaking of the agaves and the yuccas, reminds me of this little fellow called the Pronuba moth. I'm going to pin him here. Very small, but the Pronuba is vitally important in the lives or in the life history of these plants because without this to pollinate the yuccas, there would be no yuccas. And some of them are quite specific. In other words, one Pronuba moth will only live on one type of a uh, yucca plant. Well, coming to animals, uh, here we have a snail, a species of snail, a desert snail that occurs in the hottest parts of the desert. We find that this little fella, however, is active principally during the winter and the spring months when it's wet. As soon as it begins to heat up, it burrows down into the ground and uh, usually presses against a stem of a plant or against a rock so as to uh, prevent any lack of moisture. Now, here's another well-known desert animal that uses his shell to protect himself from the heat and at the same time conserve uh, moisture. That's our desert tortoise. Uh, in the eastern United States, uh, there's one very similar to this called the gopher tortoise. This one is one of the western deserts, however. They live in burrows about four feet in the ground, especially in the springtime, and uh, when the heat becomes intense during the summer, they'll go down uh, into the ground and stay there, waiting to come out in the cooler parts of the day to uh, feed on the vegetation. There are many different kinds of uh, lizards that occur in desert areas because uh, an environment like that is very favorable for reptiles. Uh, of course, they have to protect themselves against heat just like any other kinds. Well, here's a well-known uh, desert lizard. This is the Chuckawalla. That name is Indian in origin. The chucks are large, heavy-bodied reptiles that sometimes attain a length of about one and one-half feet. 
They're fond of sun, and on nice days, they'll be out on the rocks sunning themselves. Incidentally, these are of a special type. They come from some of the desert islands in the Gulf of California. And they're quite, uh, uh, they're vegetarians, and they like flowers. Sunflowers are the favorite food. You can see one uh, eating on that to flower. Of course, uh, when the flowers are available on the desert, they feed on them quite commonly. And whenever they're frightened, they will dive into a crack in the rock, and they have the power of blowing themselves up, taking in air. And when you want to get them out, the only thing you can do is to break the rock. Another important and large reptile that occurs in the deserts of western North America is the Gila monster. You see them here. Now, while Bob Dempster is feeding them an egg, I'd like to illustrate a close relative of the Gila monster. This is the beaded lizard that occurs down in Mexico. The beaded lizard and the Gila monster are the only two poisonous lizards that occur in the world. Some of these fellows, you know, uh, actually attain a length of about uh, oh, two feet, don't they, Earl? And yes, that's I know right. in captivity, this, some yes. of them will live to about 19 years. Now, this tail is something that's quite important. He uses this to store food. And during the times of the year when food's not available, this fleshy tail is a thing that he draws on by way of food supply. Now we'll put him back down in here. This is a very interesting lizard. This is a desert type. Uh, That's one of, one of the spiny swifts. Uh, it was photographed by our friend, Dr. Robert Stebbins. Uh, he probably derives his name from the fact that he moves pretty rapidly over the desert. You can see he's watching a spider there right now. Now here's another more dangerous fellow. This is the sidewinder. You can see where he gets his name from that peculiar gait. See him angling along there sideways? This will distinguish him from any other kind of rattlesnake that you'd find on the desert. Uh, sidewinders live on little rodents, uh, such as we see here. Rodents are very abundant in desert areas. Now, by contrast with the sidewinder, which is a rattlesnake and lives in this region here of the deserts of the southwestern, southwestern United States, let's go over to Africa. The desert area is in here, and we find an entirely different type of, an, of a reptile that looks somewhat like the uh, sidewinder. It has the horns over the eyes, and as I move this fellow, you can see the very characteristic appearance. Now I'm going to take him out of there and put him down on a sand area and I'd like to see you have you see the motion that he uses in uh, progressing over the sand. Now this is probably one of the most poisonous reptiles that we've had here on Science in Action. The horned viper from Africa. Now notice, notice this method of locomotion. The S-shaped locomotion and the reason he uses that is that this is the type of method that is best adapted to getting over loose sand. He's not related to the rattlesnake, but he looks almost identical to him. He lacks, however, the rattles on the tail. Now, in this same area, we have a lizard, the Sahara monitor, or African monitor. The largest lizards in the world are the monitor lizards, one of which I have here. They are found in many different deserts. In Australia, for example, these fellas, listen to him hiss, he doesn't like that. In Australia, the natives like to eat these fellas. Well, we won't get them too excited. Monitors sometimes attain a length of about nine feet. They're carrion eaters for the most part, like to live on any old carcasses that they find in desert areas. Well, I might mention, Bob, that this fellow came from Saudi Arabia, where the temperature is around 105 degrees, and uh, we didn't have very much luck feeding him, and then we found out about this temperature requirement, moved the temperature up to that, and then he fed very well. Well, passing on from such things as monitors over to uh, something as we see here. These, of course, are the quail. Two types. Uh, sometimes we see a lot of birds in the desert, other times few. Any special reason? Well, birds are abundant in the desert in the early spring, and then they nest, and most of them leave. The desert quail, however, is an exception to this. They stay there the year around. Uh, they have to have water, however, so we find them concentrated around uh, little desert pools and springs. Mm -hmm. Now, we actually have two species of quail here. These are the desert quail, or gamble quail, over on this side. You'll notice that when they get sideways, their top knots are directed forward. By way of contrast, we have a mountain quail over here. Notice that its top knot goes directly back. Well, how about the uh, sage grouse, Bob, and the way that that bird has been able to survive and adapt itself to desert conditions in Nevada and a lot of these other areas? Well, I think sage grouse are very interesting. They're remarkable birds, and they spend most of their lives in the sage. 
In the spring of the year, they gather at certain places that are called studding grounds. You hear the males and feet large sacks in their necks and show off in front of the females. This is a rather curious courtship performance, and it's only carried on in the early morning and late afternoon hours. During the middle of the day, the birds will spread out into the adjacent desert brush area to feed. You know, the air in those sacks seems to be instrumental in producing a rather peculiar sound that one can hear a long ways off, especially if there are a hundred or more spreading. Sounds something like this. Bloop, bloop, bloop. You do that very well. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's fairly good evidence to indicate that uh, the same strutting grounds have been used for years, in fact, for centuries, by these birds. We know this uh, from the fact that uh, there are Indian blinds around there made of rocks, showing that the Indians have used them for many, many generations. As a consequence, it's a very excellent place to pick up arrowheads. Found lots of them there. Well, suppose now, Bob, that we look at a bird which is quite typical of the southwestern deserts of the United States, one, one that is resident there the year-round, the roadrunner. And here we see him trying to catch that snake that is up on that bush. It looks like a patch-nosed snake. We'll watch him very carefully and see what happens. Of course, they feed on snakes and lizards. And uh, he's looking the situation over. Oh, there oh, he goes. Yeah, there he goes. You know, there are lots of different names that have been applied to this particular bird. We call him a roadrunner now because he tends to run uh, along roads ahead of you if you're driving through the desert. Uh, in some places, they call them chaparral cocks. You can see he kind of looks like a little fighting game cock there. He's certainly after that snake. Very isn't active he? fella. Uh, the uh, Spaniards used to refer to them as paisanos. <laughs> Uh, because they were kind of rough and ready, but uh, good-hearted uh, birds. In other words, diamonds in the rough. Well, they actually go after rattlesnakes and things like that and are able to kill them and, uh, and eat them, are they not? Yes, that's right. <clears throat> well, now, Bob, passing on to, uh, from birds back to mammals again, I remember you were saying earlier that our deserts uh, quite often have very heavy mammal populations. And what I'm wondering about in Asia and uh, some of those areas, little desert animals such as these hamsters, uh, are they as common as uh, many that we find in our own deserts. Well, I don't know, Earl. I've never done any trapping in the deserts of the old world, but I've trapped lots in our own southwestern deserts. Seen many places where I could put out 100 traps and expect to get 90 small mammals the next morning. Mm -hmm. I think uh, mammals are probably more abundant in desert areas than anywhere else in the world. Well, uh, kangaroo rats and pocket mice would be uh, among the principal desert rodents that we find in our country here. Would it, would it not be? That's right. Uh, little animals like this kangaroo rat here are wonderfully adapted to survive on the desert and at the same time avoid the hostile conditions presented. Look at the long hind legs there and the long tail. That accounts for the name kangaroo rat. These little fellows, you know, have very remarkable sense of hearing. Uh, they can detect uh, enemies sneaking up on them in the sand, things like kit foxes and whatnot. Well, now, some of these animals, of course, can do without water for long periods of time. Uh, is there a special reason for that? Well, I know that some of them, like pocket mice here, I've kept one, for example, related to this little spiny pocket mouse that we have here, for seven years, and he ate nothing but air-dried seeds. No water, no greens whatsoever. You know, an interesting thing about it is that I captured them at uh, Yucca Flat in southern Nevada. Let's see, that's where they have their atom bomb range at the present time, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think he has many relatives living there now. Well, now, Bob, just what is the mechanism whereby an animal like this can live on dried seeds and yet never require water? Well, the driest seeds still contain some moisture, and furthermore, uh, we find that these animals can uh, produce water from this dried seed in their system. In other words, we have metabolic water produced. And, of course, uh, these animals conserve moisture by plugging the holes, of the, that is, their burrows, uh, during the hot period, and then some of them either estivate or hibernate, whichever the condition may be. That's right. Prairie dog is a good example of an animal that hibernates in the winter time. Mm -hmm. We find that uh, prairie dogs are uh, fairly common in the edges of deserts, so although they're more typically uh, occur in uh, the prairies that uh, are found to the north. Uh, they usually occur in colonies, and in the spring of the year, uh, you can uh, see them out in search of food after their long winter sleep. Prairie dogs uh, have very extensive underground burrow systems, and usually at the entrance to each burrow, there will be a uh, mound on which uh, one of them uh, will sit and act more or less as a sentinel so as to detect the approach of danger if anything comes along to sneak up on them. Of course, they fatten up in the winter season, put on big layers of fat to tide them over. <laughs>
Well, prairie dogs are certainly very, very interesting uh, mammals, Bob. Uh, there's one type of a desert animal we haven't mentioned, and that is old Humpy here. And Humpy is a two-humped camel, in other words, a Bactrian camel. Years ago, paleontologists tell us that uh, these animals lived in North America, but then they migrated, and today in South America we find the llamas and the alpacas. Then there was one group that migrated from uh, uh, North America over to Asia and Africa, and uh, present time in those areas, two kinds of camels, the one hump camel, which is the dromedary, the two hump camel, the Bactrian, which we have right here in uh, Humpy. Now, <laughs> well, you know, these humps are very interesting because they're somewhat like the uh, uh, tail of our Gila monster. In other words, there are places where the animal stores up food and uh, liquid to tide them over the uh, lean period. You know, camels are very remarkably adapted to desert conditions, and for this reason, they've been used as beasts of burden for uh, many generations. You find them in the Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert, and uh, even on uh, the deserts of Western North America. Uh, the interesting thing to me about a camel is that despite the fact that it's remarkably adapted to desert conditions, it can also withstand extreme cold. We find them used in Siberia, where the temperature may drop down to 50 below zero. They're right there in the same country as you find reindeer. Well, Bob, uh, in looking back at uh, Humpy and at the various types of demonstrations that we've had in the laboratory, one thing that stands out in my mind is the fact that these animals that live in the desert, uh, they haven't uh, fought the environment, so to say. They have adapted themselves to it and all sorts of adaptations have been worked out so that today we have a, really a great fauna and flora in our deserts. I want to thank you, Dr. Robert Orr, for coming to Science in Action to tell us about deserts and desert life. It's been a pleasure, Earl. Now I'll be back in just a moment with the Animal of the Week. For our Animals of the Week, we'd like to talk about a principle, the principle of protection among some of the desert animals. This uh, is the desert tortoise. It's found in areas in the west, for example, over in here, down through here, and over in the southeastern portion, we have the famous gopher. A turtle, it looks like this, very heavy shell. On the other side, you see the shell extends over, so the turtle can pull back into this, and he's extremely well protected from his uh, predators. Now, in the central and eastern portion of the United States, we have a turtle that looks like this very cute little fellow, the ornate turtle, but he has a hinge on this part of the shell so that the, when he pulls back into the shell, then that hinge drops into place, starts working, and that part of the door allows him to be perfectly protected from any enemy that might come into the area. Now, as we move over from dry to semi-dry to finally aquatic forms, we find that they don't have need of such protection and these little turtles, which are similar to those sold as pets, actually these are chicken turtles, demonstrate the shell arrangement, which we have on these fellows. They can't pull entirely back into the shell, but they are fairly well protected. Now among the other semi-aquatic forms are the, some of the sea turtles, and this young green sea turtle demonstrates the shell arrangement that we have in these fellows. In other words, he can pull back a little bit, but his flippers are always out there and they're always exposed so that actually we're losing some of the protection of the shell. And finally, coming over to the wholly aquatic types, the soft shell turtles, we found the least amount of shell, insofar as protection is concerned, among any of the turtles. And these small soft shells, about a dozen of which we have buried down the tank, I'll see if I can raise them up here, are truly aquatic. And they are able to breathe underwater. It's the only type of turtle that can do that because they have a very vascular throat, and they take water into the throat and are able to uh, take oxygen from the water much in the manner of the, what the fish does. These are the soft shells, and they are very fragile when they're out of the water. So that if you have them as pets and are transporting them, you have to be extremely careful in what you do. They grow quite large, and actually they are one of the best turtles insofar as edibility is concerned. This is the soft shell, and we have a number of different types that range in the aquatic areas across the United States. Well, enough for our turtles and the way in which their shells serve as a mechanism of protection. What's that, Pop? Corn? Well, that's actually what it is. Uh, popcorn in the form of seeds. And seeds, of course, are, are quite common. They're common knowledge to all of us. And on our next program, we're going to be concerned with some of the 
problems in the seed, seed field. A special guest coming from Minneapolis from the Northrop King Seed Company, Mr. L.W. Corbett. We hope that you will be with us on our next program when we look into this problem, uh, the problems in the seed field. Thanks a lot. You have just seen another in the fascinating television series, Science in Action. Science in Action is produced by the California Academy of Sciences under the supervision of Dr. Robert C. Miller.